Welcome to Lola and the Poets, a podcast on the magical reel. Hello there, dear people. I hope it's a peaceful day wherever you are. This is Lola and the Poets, and it's a solo show called In the Shadows, Part 1. Hundreds of thousands of people are going to listen to him over the radio, and unless he says something that's, well, that's sensational, it's just no good. A uh, big warm welcome to all those who started to follow Lola and the Poets in November and December before I went well off air, and to all those who found me now, as we're back in the month of June when all in the Northern Hemisphere blooms no matter the personal or collective circumstance. I'm reaching you via these wires, waves, and your own synapses from the flatlands of Novi Sad, my hometown, a very pretty and fairly large city in Northern Serbia in what could be called the start of the second month of our provisional freedom, or rather the sudden relaxing of quarantine lockdown, which also lasted two months. It started here mid-March, like most other places in the West, um, but we had um, curfew as well. And as almost everywhere else in the world, except perhaps China, the pandemonium arrived quite a few months after our collective teacher, Corona took her first eerie stroll through downtown Wuhan. So before this um, pale queen of our 2020 collective tale took residence in our atmosphere and our immune systems, started to recognize a new presence in our midst when she was still perhaps a glint in a lowly lab bat's eye or more likely a tear, I started Lola and the Poets podcast. I had a few shows and conversations lined up for the beginning of year and was meaning to do a solo show on the concept of the shadow in late December or early January, right about uh, winter solstice eclipse around Christmas time and just before Saturn and Pluto famously aligned in Capricorn. Start with the absence um, and go towards the presence of light. I um, think that was my plan and it did not happen. Actually, some of it did, but um, did not wind up on air, uh, nor did any other show I planned for half a year. Although I did manage to tape a lovely conversation with Divyam, my friend, an artist and storyteller from London. And that was end of January, so no, end of February, um, just a week or so before our respective lockdowns began. She does amazing and magical work with her art, and we know each other for over two decades. So it was a very lively convo. And really interesting to hear now, in retrospect, um, as we were uh, both in a pre-corona bubble. It will come out as the next episode. So the first glitch um, in my schedule I had beginning of year did not really surprise me as the planetary weather was really dense for everybody. Um, But for me with uh, my Libra sun. Uh, being squared to the degree by the um, great Saturn-Pluto conjunction mid-January. Everything I did seemed to me to be uh, in some sort of um, an underworld capacity. I uh, felt I entered a labyrinth and was evading the inevitable monster at its centre by staying at the periphery. Um, 
all um, who are versed in celestial arts uh, knew something substantial and irreversible will be brewing this year. And I listened to a few I trust uh, describe the overall patterns of events with uh, extreme precision. It's just the scale and the furious space of it all that was the surprise. So Global March was Rodin's Gates of Hell. May was me like everyone else looking at past events in the review mirror and getting myself in work mode after the big showdown. In a way coming towards this June solstice eclipse um, on the day Mercury turns retrograde seems a counterintuitive and inauspicious time to get back on air. But um, in a very strange way, uh, shadow logic way, uh, this is the exact right time to go back and into what was lost and retrieve it. So this will be a solo show on the shadow, but it will be part one of three because the shadow needs more space. I'm still in contemplation on the um, collective and personal impacts of the pandemic. The deep pestilence talk will keep till part three after all things regarding it come to light for which this eclipse is not the right time. It's one of the trickiest subjects to dive into, the concept of the shadow, part of myths and lore across the globe um, since recorded human time began and then absorbed into Carl Jung's theory of personality and then all its new age derivatives, uh, representing it an essential part of our nature, the part that's neglected, um, shunned, shamed, ignored, uh, the part of us we leave to fester in the dark and are forced to face only when the sore is brought to the boil. When there is an infection overwhelming the entire system, that is us. The thing that is important to understand with the shadow is that part of our story exists within it. And it is immaterial if we are determined to believe that there is nothing there, both personally and collectively. Uh, the missing part of the puzzle that is us continues to live in the dark and affects us daily through its ghostly whispers in our dreams and its distortions of our perceptions, the anguish of our emotions in our waking hours. So, um, I'll kick off this talk about the other side by assessing the last four months of time we had standing still on earth through a weird personal kind of prism. And then I'll tell you a story about my first therapeutic regression experience when I was in my mid-twenties, which took me back into some unknown time on Earth. And that'll be fun. Whether it was a real memory or a sort of a collective emotional imprint that could only be read through a personal narrative, I don't know. Um, but it might be good for you to hear at this point in our timelines for some reason or other. Curses cease to exist when you look them in the eye, but we must do this with our faces turned back to them through a mirror. This is what a Mercury retro is very good for and what the myth of the Medusa tells us. What it also tells us, um, the myth of Medusa, is that if we dig into it with a compassionate heart, is that real villains might not be as obvious as the ones ending up with serpents as hair. It's a product of the revenge of the gods, the serpents as hair. Looking back on these few months that seem so elongated and indistinguishable from each other in individual form, I feel as we entered something closer to ultra reality, a density of existence, a place with no way out other than into the thickest sort of darkness, unable to see anything, but able to feel everything by virtue of a microorganism that connected us through our own mortality, I think. Um, I figure that most people never wanted to learn anything from all of this, but all were terrified of failing a test that was handed to us in the most obvious manner. Sometime um, 10 years ago, in um, the aftermath of a serious infection I went through, and was not really fully aware of the time I was going through. I was focusing on uh, finding a theme for enrolling in doctoral studies in the media. And I started thinking of the effects of cinematic meta-narratives as prolonged infectious processes that have similar symptoms in large groups of people. 
as sort of a shamanic collective illness that in some way bonds the spectator to the end game of the saga they are hooked on, alleviating the severity of the infection with each installment. That was very interesting, connecting um, a physical state that I had with theory. I think it somehow made a connection that was impossible to understand until quite later on. So this alleviating of symptoms that installments of sagas do are like antiviral jabs, I guess, a course of in antibiotics, an easing of the burden of an inner storyline, the sagas mirror within us, a burden of us, I guess, um, but not curing this ailment, not alleviating the burden until the very end. So following the sagas becomes paramount. I think it's also when storytellers try to prolong a naturally completed story um, that seems so unnatural and somehow ill-conceived. And uh, the emphasis here is on the word ill. It's the medium itself that is addictive and the narrative that is infectious. And today, in this very weird twist of faith, this particular idea guided me in following the Corona storyline in a way that helped me make sense of it. However, back in 2009, when I attempted that PhD on the premise of narrative as infection, um, it ended up as not happening, uh, happening in a more peculiar way. I'll pop your link um, on the entire proposal text in the show notes if you would like to have a look or a read and maybe understand why it kind of disappeared um, as an academic option at the time. I understand it now completely, that the timing was off and I was kind of running a little bit early for people to really be able to integrate it into an academic context in the way they might possibly be willing to do now. So uh, as William Boris puts it, language is a virus from outer space and Yes, I don't think we are so much addicted to narratives as we're infected by them and we seek a cure as to find release from a story. So it stops repeating itself ad infinitum and a lot of therapists will tell you this. This is not a novel idea as well in itself as illnesses of tribal priests were always deemed initiatory and initiation in itself is a story only it moves our consciousness beyond the narrative outlines and into the unknown and silent stillness of being when we are able to look at our burning story only as a story and nothing else. And this is why I started applying it to cinema, studying the initiatory process in all Hermetica, as well as that early theory um, of a medium that arises when we're faced with a new phenomenon, um, when we see it with a fresh pair of eyes for the first time. After a while, our senses are numb and our judgment becomes jaded by routine. So n the way we see cinema now, the way we see television now, and millennials, possibly not my Gen X, but the millennials for sure, the way they see the internet now, Gen Z, the way they see the social media now. It's all through eyes that are used to something and therefore cannot really understand a phenomenon from its roots. Or at least this is how I feel. So unless we go back to a sensation, a phenomenon, like witches and wizards do in a trance, in a way unless we become sick with it on purpose, with the jaded eyes that we have, we cannot understand it really. That's the part of the process that I'm very willing to understand this year. When we're in any kind of pain, in inflammation, illness, and infection, it is also natural for that to be our central point of focus. And in the case of the technically, um, and technocratically actually named COVID-19 as a new version of the old coronavirus uh, of the common cold. It was and still is literally the reference point for the world. It's our narrative now. 
And that's why I'm looking at it as a narrative. Fully aware that it's so much more than that. But to understand it, I'm looking at it through this prism. And hopefully some of it will be helpful to people listening to this. So the entire population of Earth is going through the same symptoms or similar symptoms. And that in a way also somehow gears us towards thinking similar thoughts and in effect living the same storyline or awaiting the symptoms with dread um, or having to witness the ones we love go through pain and sometimes face death. So our collective story now is facing our own interconnectedness because the pandemic wouldn't happen if we are not so absolutely and constantly connected. And that's it's such a extraordinary thing to comprehend in a fragmented world that became ever so more fragmented as time went by in the past 20 years. As we literally became islands in our pods and our bubbles and our echo chambers. This incredible connectedness now emerges as contagion. And we now are faced with understanding the importance of sharing physical spaces with others, um, the importance of touch and our own mortality, our own inevitable mortality. And how we deal with these unassailable facts of life, personally and as a whole, um, as an entirety, is what the story of our species will continue to be, I think. And there are forces in our collective and personal shadows, I also think and feel, um, that seem to be literally fighting for our soul's allegiances in which storyline of the future we will now choose. This is more sinister and less sinister than it sounds in, in a way, because a lot of it is very visible um, to the naked eye, which is the way we are geared towards a particular media narrative, depending on our personal values and views, fears, hopes, our ways of understanding what is really important in life. Hopefully everybody thinks that life is the most important thing in life, living it, preserving it, making it healthy, but also what is important in life is the content of life. So this is now where we are. And I think this is the reason why we also must understand the origins of the Corona story. At some point, we must understand it. Um, because as we would with any dominant narrative, um, to know the beginning of something is to choose the right way to complete it, to end it. And maybe even more importantly, to wisely navigate all the steps in between. So this is our focus now and this is the world theatre is plague and plague is theatre of which Arto spoke himself a victim of constant illness, both mental and physical. It's easier to understand intellectually everything one undergoes physically, the way our mind works and I guess vice versa as well. So this is a truth that was lost in splitting the of the two, of the mind and the body in our various um, philosophies in the past 200 years. So the feeling of these times, these times we're all going through, obviously, but um, in also a very profound way, because as I said, we're actually all going through the same story now. There are no other stories. This is the dominant one. It seemed very familiar to me when it started. And maybe this is the case for most people, maybe it's the case for some people, or maybe for none, but I doubt that. This dense, ultra-real, yet otherworldly, granular terror of these times, but also this incredible potency 
of some sort of hope in these times felt as something that I knew or experienced. And there were dreams I had throughout January that were indicators to me that this will be the time of a reactivation of, of, um, of a different time. So only recently when I was getting ready to record this show did I also remember a therapeutic experience I had 24 years ago. That was in 96 um, when I went through uh, my first in a series of non-hypnotic regressions with uh, this great therapist, uh, Ljubica, that she herself came to do what she did through having endured great hardship, being confined in a state of illness. It was a very odd time, the mid-90s um, in um, ex-Yugoslavia and Serbia. And although the civil war ended, the aftermath of what the war was, the aftershock, the debris, the emotional impact of it um, had all just begun, really. So the sense memory of that actual time, but also the parallel timeline, I have dived into in this session um, had popped up just in time for me <laughs> to make it uh, into this show and I guess it's as its main metaphysical dish as well. I wanted to share a personal experience rather than intellectually distancing myself with talk on myth and theory. So this is where you will get a tale of old Atlantis instead as it pertains to some sorts of human or humanoid pre-existence having in nature of experience a different sensory a different sensory coordinates than any other therapeutic regression I went through since and there were a few that followed this one it could have just been an immersion into a parallel world a dreamscape where humans have a different shape and presence and avatar reality it just had a different hue a different feel a di uh, just a, it was not it was not um earth as we know it. Of course it could also have been an entirely personal symbolic journey into my own biography um, and perceptions of a shadow reality in the life I lead here and now. When I was talking to Ljubica in the session um, I was interested to know about the first experience on earth my soul had. Yes, this is always We always had um, a short talk to set an intention um, before I would go into relaxation and the regression would start. What I wanted was a sort of a first point of call in an adventurous journey of incarnations. Not so much touristy, more, I guess, um, piratey, um, just traveling the seas and seeing where I landed first. But what I got as a result of this intention was a realm of being um, that seemed entirely alien to how we experience our planet today. So this is what I would like to share now because it does remind me in some ways of the feeling of being in the now. Not in the realm of the senses so much as emotionally. And in this guided vision the images and situations were opening in my mind's eye very clearly and very vividly. And generally when I went into uh, the regressions, it would be easy for me to visualize things. Um, I never had a problem with it, but this is the first time. So everything took me by surprise. It was just this amazing um, picture, a film that was um, uh, taking place. I guess about three or five seconds before I could think about it. So it's it's uh, kind of an opposite thing of the way that we visualize things. We think of things and then images appear. Uh, in regressions and states of meditation, images appear before you actually think of them. And that's when you actually enter the alpha state or deeper. So uh, the planet with its where I was, which was Earth, 
because that was where my intentions were set. So I believed that it was. Um, and I also believe that this might be just the way you see things in regression. But then afterwards, I learned that that was not the case. Next regressions were absolutely Earth-like. So the dense atmosphere of this um, place was, in a sense, it was as if my body was moving through water. Uh, and um, But not quite. There was a mermaid-like quality to the shape of me, although with no tails or fins. I had an elongated, quite elastic, pale-skinned body. The communication between people by, uh, was by thoughts and not by words. Well, that's how I got it. Um, and there was a sense of dread as well that I felt immediately walking into this space and this land. Um, because I just felt so open to being under unending surveillance because of these ways of communication that were so immediate. So it was feeling of not having the freedom of emotional or spiritual distance um, or dissent, really, in the sense of being away from a norm or a reigning um, ideology or culture. And I understood as well very quickly that the citizens or people um, in, in um, this society, as well as me, um, were immediately training themselves how to hide thoughts and emotions in order not to be singled out, punished severely and um, in many cases actually sent for reprogramming, which is something I get quite, um, um, it's quite interesting in, in terms of, of being reprogrammed emotionally. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was um, a dark aquatic land, a totalitarian control, <laughs> a green bluish in hue, uh, where all of humanity had a subconscious connection due to a way of interrelating that would instantly connect one to any other individual on earth, but also leave one fully vulnerable to the manipulative mechanics of society's controllers and emotional disturbances of others on this prison planet without a way to shelter your own individuality, personal space, uh, in a way, without a way to keep your soul's hygiene. What was um, clear to me through this um, vision or soul dream uh, was this incredible desire to escape this pressured suffocating existence, a very lonely existence. What I saw in this vision as a pivotal point of disturbance or evil, let's call it, because we're talking about the shadow, so it's a concept that's part of the shadow in this complete societal dynamic had a very human and familiar face and an aspect of ownership, a proprietary aspect to it, to all human produce, uh, be it emotions or thoughts and bodies as well. In effect, um, it had a stifling of growth of another, which in itself is the antithesis to life. What I also sensed it had is, is that it had a propensity for engineering of not only our biology, but of soul material and created new genetic and psychological chimeras um, that were accelerated in evolution themselves. It was a very science-based society, I guess, um, comparing it to now, much more advanced, but in a different kind of way. And with these beings that accelerated in evolution, through scientific uh, interventions and interference, these beings were not yet ready to emerge into existence as beings in their own right, having been devoid of, uh, I guess, um, a right of being. It was a dreadful picture. It was really, truly dreadful. Um, and now when I think about it, 
even if it was not um, something that um, was from our own collective uh, memory. As a metaphor, it served to show how when an interference that does not come from love of a creativity or a divinity, but of um, hubristic mental power structure, it it creates an entity that um, an entity, uh, societal entity, or an actual um, shape or form, at least um, in the um, physiological realms, um, that perpetuates in its own image through a diversification into new forms that serve it in frequency, being mere transmitters of its agency rather than having an agency and creative evolution of their own. So I would say um, the parallels would be today's cloning and various kind of mutations that are inflicted on our natural allies on plants and on animals. So yeah, it was a very hellish landscape of a um, corrupt civilization that imploded, I guess, in the height of its own powers, which is when I encountered this vision, uh, when the corruption was well on its way. It was also abusing its initiation processes because although it was a scientific society, it had a very strong um, hierophant presence to it, a very strong priestly class. It was, I guess, um, in a kind of a way, a precursor to ancient Egypt. That's why I called it um, Atlantis. Of course, it can be called anything else. Pre-deluge society, let's call it, or something existing somewhere else, um, being then transported to this existence. In a way, it's not that really important um, because there was this truth within what I saw that I could see being perpetuated today, a truth about what could happen to society when it has extreme technical and scientific knowledge, when the, the system of belief and spiritual system is corrupt, and when a few are through various means being able to um, decide on the destinies of the many, which is the story of our humanity. But now we are at a point where we are able to do so much, but still really haven't developed our own psyches enough to have the responsibility to contain um, what we know in a way that will not destroy us. So with initiation processes, um, what I saw um, was that they were, instead of being used as vehicles uh, for the creative divine, were used as mere energy food for controlling entities of the priestly class, um, which positioned itself um, almost as a steel grid between the individual and the source of the individual's vital sustenance. A grid that maybe filtered, in some sense, the sun itself. It was a very dark place. It was like uh, the most heavily polluted city I've ever been in, and then times 20. Um, it was very, very strange to, because uh, when you are, uh, when one goes into a regression, uh, what you also get is, um, sensory memories. So this solar lifeline, this vital sustenance of individuals, comes from a place of true relationship with the soul of this planet, with the animal mundi. And therefore our solar system as a totality had weakened in presence, if you will, through all the soul debris in the atmosphere. And these, this uh, insatiable hacking of human material in order to fulfill a systemic need for perpetual control in an essential fear of the system's failure, in the system's not being able to face its own inevitable mortality. Because uh, what I understood was that the 
entire idea behind the experiments was to artificially perpetuate um, organic matter, the life of this lifespan of organic matter. This as an artificial linear substitute for a cyclical nature of all phenomena which evolved naturally through their own long inner almost divination processes, evolutionary divination processes. And at the end, I seem to have escaped this realm, um, but I guess it never escaped me. In other words, I carried um, the stone called heaviness of this ungodly business in all my endeavors from then on. This is what I got from this regression when I woke up, or rather was released from it. Um, and uh, it was a reference point afterwards for me in, in my everyday life that had nothing to do with Atlantis um, or pre delage societies, pre delage totalitarian societies that I saw in visions. It was the, the threat was a reference point with which I measured all that threatened my personal freedom as well as the freedom of others. Give me some yeah, it gave me a very solid feeling of how it feels when things start to close in. Which brings me now to a lighter part of uh, this podcast and towards the end. And that is uh, this darkly comical dream, I think I can even say. Um, <clears throat> I had in 2009, which was the year... I tried to research these themes of narrative control within the scientific institutions and I didn't. So I was dream dreaming all sorts of stuff and I, at that time I really wasn't really writing down my dreams. Now I do but also um, I'm lazy so only if something extraordinary happens then I write it down. But this dream I remembered and I remember it because um, I told it to maybe three, four friends. And then that's why I remembered it from then on. And then it just became very relevant. So it was a reference point uh, as well. So it was an apocalyptic dream in which I was among many other people enclosed in a space, a bunker of sorts. And something was going on on the outside, uh, which was dangerous to humans, whether it was... Um, radiation or pestilence or a combination of both uh, but uh, we were in, all instructed to stay inside without fail and the dream itself also might have mirrored an actual short film that I shot the year of the therapeutic session in 96 in a sort of a loop or a spiral of synchronicities as these things happen um, in our lives I'm sure in yours as well so this film in, from 96 was called The Shelter and um, it was filmed in an actual shelter in Serbia and used for its purpose actually during the 99 NATO bombings. Um, so that film um, it was a story I wrote and it was for the theatre and then I turned it into a short film. Um, a group of characters were um, in a bunker and there was an unknown danger outside spiraling out of control and they were awaiting their fate and they were failing to act. But in the 2009 dream, um, I did manage to run outside because I was running off to my dog and I was unable to keep an eye on a man that seemed to be the guy in control or rather the guy that in handling controls of this strange operation, the dude that was um, supposed to oversee that we're all okay. And this man um, is sitting in front of this huge panel with lots of buttons and um, visitors and all sorts of um, shiny stuff. Um, appeared to be completely untrained and unable to handle such an enormous task. So he was, he was very slack, very um, entirely unfit for the job. Went on coffee breaks quite often. And for some reason, I thought I just need to keep an eye on this guy. <laughs> because he would just ruin everything but I ran after my dog um, um, so um, upon my return into the shelter I saw 
that this man went on his coffee break. And uh, what I saw was a seemingly very wrong set of buttons pressed on the control panel. And then, then there was an eruption of nuclear proportions. And I had, I think I had a blackout in my dream, which is like a blackout in a dream within a dream. And when I finally came to, uh, when I, I guess, came out of this short circuit, I slowly crawled out of the bunker, which was in, yeah, it was, it was gone, really. So I crawled out of the debris and went into the streets of this town I was in. And I saw a very long line of people waiting to make a phone call in a very old type of phone box, the one you find everywhere. But this had, this looked a lot like London phone boxes. And was the only available and existent form of telecommunication left. So everybody was trying to make a phone call, call their loved ones, whomever. But what I noticed when I started passing by all these people, where a lot of them were melded, physically melded with a piece of equipment they were holding during the nuclear blast. So these cyborgs were half toaster, half human, um, their heads, arms, and legs were part microwave and part mobile phone and vacuum cleaners and part flesh. And even in the dream, it was extremely grotesque, but there was just this element of, of that whatever they, were, they had at hand became part of them. And they all had a sort of appliance. They were holding on to an appliance, as we all do all the time now. So... It was humanity integrated with a now defunct machinery because the appliances didn't work. And although physically people seem to still be okay, although melded with this appliance, they also somehow, of course, lost their form in this very dark and yet very comical symbiosis. So these two very strange little stories from my own shadows seem to intersect somewhere in in essence and they're both my own visions so they're absolutely not in any way predictions um so i felt that um today when mercury stops in the skies was the time to tell them and just air them and let them go um Neither of the stories should be our story, but it's always very, very good to think about what would happen in order to avoid it. Maybe I was tricked into doing it by Mercury, um, but maybe it was the right thing to do, so we'll see. And if some of your own visions and dreams um, overlap with mine, um, I do hope you find solace in find, finding someone else existing in your frequency range. I always find solace in that, so this is why I chose to do not only this show, but why I chose to do the podcast. But if it's all new and a bit too strange for you, I hope I was of some amusement, because good laugh is really important too, especially now. <laughs> so... Now I will go and start the process of uploading this. This is the first show in six months that completely changed the world. So I pray it might go without too many technical glitches today. Although, you know, anything can happen. And all of this talk be lost somewhere in cyberspace and hidden from you. But if it's any good, it will always be available to you. As Bulgakov said, or rather Bulgakov's horned antagonist, in the Master of Margarita said, uh, manuscripts don't burn. So, until next time, hope you stay tuned to Lowlander Poets. I got great stuff in the pipeline, solo and conversation-wise. Please stay in the sacred, especially if you're walking in the dark. Be healthy and be your own secret society. Good luck.